Hello. To make this video, I had to rewatch this entire movie tonight because it had been a long time since I'd seen this movie. And this is also my probably least favorite of the three Conjuring movies that we're gonna talk about because there's no real comedic relief. I mean, Brad's there, but it's like, I mean, you know me, I'm not scared of horror movies, so it's like, whatever, but it's just kind of bland. And, but anyway, so we're talking about the first Conjuring, which is the one that got a historical event wrong, but um, we're not here to talk about history. If you want to know the real history of Bathsheba, I can make a whole video about that. I don't think I'd enjoy it, but I can. Anyway, so, because the witch trials just make me mad. Anyway, so, here's what we do for our videos. We read the plot, I put in the clip, and then I will give you my rating. Now, the clip that I'm putting in isn't necessarily my favorite, because like I just said, I don't really have a favorite part out of this movie, but it's a clip that the real Lorraine is in, so if you can find her, good. And it kind of explains what happens in the movie in case you're lost when watching it. So I feel like that would be the good clip to put in. So anyway, we're going to get into the plot. If this sounds familiar, it's because these are based off actual things that happen that you can find online. So anyway, let's jump into it. In 1971, Roger and Carolyn Perrin move into a farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island with their five daughters, Andrea, Nancy, Christine, Cindy, and April. Their dog, Sadie, refuses to enter the house. They discover the entrance to a cellar, which has been boarded up. Paranormal events occur within the first few nights. Every clock in the house stops at 3.07 a.m. Birds fly into their windows. Sadie is found dead in the morning and Carolyn wakes up with large bruises. One night, Christine enter, encounters a malevolent spirit. Another night, Carolyn hears clapping in the hallway and becomes trapped in the basement. Andrea and Cindy are attacked in their bedroom by a spirit believed to be the one that Christine had encountered. Carolyn contacts demonologist Ed and Lorraine Warren, who have recently investigated a possessed doll called Annabelle. The Warrens agree to take the case and conduct an initial investigation during which Lorraine, a clairvoyant, sees the dark forces have latched on to the Perrin family, and leaving the house will not free them. To gather evidence, they place cameras, recorders, and bells around the house with the help of their assistant, Drew Thomas, and police officer Brad Hamilton. Farther research reveals that the house once belonged to an accused witch named Bathsheba Sherman, a relative of Marytown Estre... S... Estre? S... Is it S.D. in the movie? S.D. I, I don't know. I've never heard of her. Who sacrificed her weak old baby to the devil and killed herself in 1863 at 3.07 in the morning after cursing all who take her land. Isn't that fantastic? They found reports of numerous murders and suicides through the years in the houses that were built on the property. One morning, Bathsheba appears to Carolyn and vomits black bile into her mouth. I thought it was blood. That's what I thought it was too. Fully possessing her. Lorraine sees Bathsheba's corpse hanging in the tree behind the house. That night, from the EVPs coming from the radio, the group hears a spirit luring Cindy into the wardrobe, where she reveals a secret passage. Lorraine enters the passage and falls through the floorboards to the cellar, where she sees the spirit of a woman whom Bathsheba had possessed long ago and used to kill her child. Lorraine loses a locket containing a picture of the Warren's daughter, Judy. Bathsheba attacks Nancy. The incident is caught on camera. The Warrens conclude it is sufficient evidence to receive authorization from the Catholic Church to perform an exorcism on the house. The Perrin family decides to take refuge at a motel, while Ed and Lorraine take their evidence to Father Gordon, their liaison with the Catholic Church. Father Gordon explains that the approval for the exorcism would have to come directly from the Vatican because the Perrin family aren't members of the church. Judy is attacked in the Warrens' own home by Bathsheba, who sitted. I think they mean who sat on a chair, but they wrote who sitted on a chair. Uh, who sat uh, on a chair and used Annabelle before being... Or who was sitting or something. Yeah, before being narrowly saved by her father. 
Annabelle returns in the box, and Bathsheba returns to her own land. Carolyn takes Christine and April back to the house to kill them. I thought it said, and kills them. Ed, Lorraine, and Brad find Carolyn in the cellar trying to stab Christine, as Roger and Drew fight to stop her. Lorraine warns Ed, Roger, and Drew that if they take Carolyn outside the house, Bathsheba will kill her. The group tied Carolyn to a chair inside. Ed says that the exorcism cannot wait and decides to attempt it himself. Though Carolyn escapes and attempts to kill April, Lorraine is able to call to Carolyn by reminding her of a special memory she shared with her family, allowing Ed to complete the exorcism and save them, lifting Bathsheba's curse, forcing her to reveal herself to those present and damning her to hell. After expelling Bathsheba from Carolyn's body, the pair and family reunites. April gives Lorraine the locket that she lost in the cellar. Returning home, Ed adds the haunted music box from the farmhouse to their room of cursed artifacts that they have collected from past cases. And there's a cool quote from Ed at the end that you all can look up yourselves. Um, which is why I think it's really interesting that, this is kind of a tangent, but which is why I think it's really interesting that people who are religious say that they believe in God, but, and like angels, but they don't believe in demons. And it's like, you can't believe in angels and not believe in demons. That's not how it works. At least that's how my head works. Anyway, I also think I had an experience with an angel, but that's a story for another time. Anyway, so... The clip I'm going to show you explains uh, basically what's going to happen. And the parent mother is there. And Lorraine is there. I'm sorry. I, The head injury I mentioned in last week's video is making me tired. Last week. Uh, the reaction videos that went up um, on Saturday. Because I'm filming this on Sunday. So yesterday they went up and... Oh, it makes me tired, and so I go to bed a certain time to get, you know, at least eight hours of sleep, because I, that's what you should do recovering, but I'm seeing my doctor tomorrow, so hopefully that'll fix everything. Anyway, back to what we're talking about. Tangent. Because people ask about my health all the time. Tangent. So, um, that is, um, so that's that. Fear is defined as a feeling of agitation and anxiety caused by the presence or imminence of danger. And whether it's a ghost, a spirit, or an entity, they all feed on it. We'll take Maurice here. He's a French-Canadian farmer, had nothing more than a third-grade education, yet after he was possessed, he spoke some of the best Latin I'd ever heard, sometimes backwards. He'd been molested by his father, who had also tortured him repeatedly. A dark spirit made its home in this man. Now, if you look into his eyes, you can see him tearing blood. And like that, an upside down cross started to appear from within his body. All right, Drew, you can hit the lights. Oh. Did you personally perform the exorcism? No, I'm not authorized, but I've assisted on many. See, an exorcism can be very dangerous, not only for the victim, but for anyone in the room. So what happened to Maurice? Well, he tried to kill his wife, but instead he shot her in the arm and then he turned the gun on himself. Maurice had a very troubled life with little to live for, and not even an exorcist could bring him back. Which brings us to the three stages of demonic activity. Infestation, oppression, and possession. Now, infestation, that's, that's the whispering, the footsteps, the feeling of another presence, which ultimately grows into oppression. The second stage. Now, this is where the victim, and it's usually the one who's the most psychologically vulnerable, is targeted specifically by an external force. Breaks the victim down, crushes their will, and once in a weakened state, leads them to the third and final stage, possession. Um, that was the video clip. I hope it, it taught you some things because Lorraine helped with the movie, so... The information in the movies is actual information, except, you know, the parts that Hollywood obviously does. Uh, in the second movie, we'll get more into how Hollywood changes the movie because the second Conjuring has more evidence of that that we could talk about. So anyway, um, uh, but my rating, 
Okay, so the second one is my favorite. Uh, this one, 7 out of 10, I'd say solid. Um, it's not my favorite. It's a good movie. Uh, very, very scary if you're looking for less comedic relief and more of a scary jump scare type of movie. This is the movie for you out of the three. Um, I don't, I think the second one is better at the scare and like stick with you scare. So what I mean by that is that's why I like the paranormal activity movie so much because after watching the movies it sticks with you. I don't mean anything gets attached to you for people who are new to how I talk. I mean the fear sticks with you. With this movie not so much because it's such a specific thing in history that they twisted the story so it's not even the true story. So it's not like, yes, this was the actual demon and it's not the actual demon that was with them. It's not, so it's not technically real, so it doesn't stick with you. But the second one, even though they added in a demon that I will never say the name of on camera, but the fact that they added in a demon that was not the demon that was oppressing this family, they did it in a way that was more real because I ended up going on a, falling into a rabbit hole and finding video of the actual exorcism that was done on the girl from Britain and they're wearing the same thing and they do it the same exact way that it happened in real life. So it's like, that one stuck with me more because it was more to the story and um, the other thing that stuck with me about that is the text at the end, which that's the clip I'm showing you for the second movie, the text at the end, because if it does not give you goosebumps or chills, mm -hmm. th th there's some disconnect. Um, cause like, I mean, I showed it to my boyfriend and I was like, I'm getting like chills and goosebumps and he's like, yeah, that's kind of creepy. But like, he didn't get chills or goosebumps. And I was like, bro, you weren't paying attention. So yeah, but every time the three of us watch it, it's always, and we watch it a lot. It's, it's all of our favorites collectively. So anyway, 7 out of 10 because I don't think the ending really sticks with you as much as the other two movies. I think the third one definitely sticks with people because it is a true <coughs> it is a true crime story. So it's not just, oh, demonic stuff. It's like true crime. So anyway, it puts my two favorite things together. So anyway, that's my rating. If you guys want to watch the first Conjuring movie, it's on Netflix probably on Amazon Prime Video too, but I want, if you want to watch it for free, watch it on Netflix. Um, yeah, so that's all I have to say. Next week is The Conjuring 2, and then we end the series this year with The Conjuring 3, because we only have time to do three more, including this one, so. I wish we had time for more, but October isn't that long of a month, sad to say. So we don't have time for a lot, but yeah. So I will see you guys in any other video that I end up putting up after this one. Bye.